In the previous video, I talked about input markets. And I drew a downward sloping demand curve. We talked about the demand curve, talked about it being a derived demand. But I didn't prove that the input demand curve was downward sloping. Now, as you know, the difference between this class and a class in principles of economics is that we try to prove everything that we're doing. And so we need to go back to that and think more carefully more deeply about the demand for inputs and try to justify the assumption that if you have an input market, the demand curve is going to be downward sloping. So that's the question. If you have an imp if you have a market for an input, then is the demand curve going to be downward sloping? So let's think about why, remember who's doing the demanding. The firm is doing the demanding, because this is an input. So why does the firm do the demanding in the first place? What does the firm want? Now, using an input has two aspects, a good part and a bad part. Okay, the bad part is the input costs you money. The good part is you buy the input, you produce more output, you sell it, you get more money from your customers. We need to separate those two things. So right now I want to talk about the benefit of hiring an extra unit of an input. So benefit from more input purchased. This is the benefit to the firm. Okay, to the input demander of purchasing more input. Well, the bottom line is he gets more revenue, so he has a change in total revenue. And we're going to look at things in the margin. So the marginal benefit that he receives from hiring an extra unit of the input is going to be phrased in this kind of way. It's the change in total revenue over at changing Q. Actually, we should probably use something. Well, we we're, we're talking about Q before as output, as corn. But here it's going to be an input. So let's um let's let's change Q to W. Let me make that change. Okay, so W is water. We could have used fertilizer here. It's just a generic input. And the marginal benefit that you get could be measured by the change in total revenue over the change in water. I'm going to rewrite that. If, as long as I divide the first fraction by the same thing as I multiply the second fraction by, then those will cancel out and I haven't changed anything. I'm going to put delta Q here, where Q means corn. W means water, just like before. Well, this is meaningful. The first term is marginal revenue, and the second term is the marginal product of water. Okay, marginal revenue is the change in total revenue as the output changes. And marginal product is how much more output you get, how much more bushel of corn you get, how many more bushel of corn you get f if you hire one more gallon of water. The left hand side also has a name. It's called uh, marginal revenue product of water. It's abbreviated M R P of W. So this is what underlies demand. This is the reason why firms want water. Is in fact you can you can trace it using the math. If you hire more water, you can produce more corn and sell it, and if you produce more corn, then you get more revenue from your customers. So that's why the firm would want water. Now, as a footnote, 
the book wants to define a special situation where the firm is competitive in the output market, so the corn market is competitive. In that case, the mar marginal revenue equals the price of corn. And the book defines the price of corn times the marginal product of water, which in this case would be, it's the same as the marginal revenue product, because you're talking about competitive corn markets. The book calls this the marginal value product of water. I am not going to use the term marginal value product at all anymore. I think it's a complication which really isn't necessary. I think you guys all know now that if the coin market is competitive, the marginal revenue is the same as price, and so you can solve any problem with that knowledge. We don't need to have another term that handles it. Now I started by saying that I want to prove that the demand curve for an input is downward sloping. How far have I gotten? Well, I now know what the demand curve for an input is. It's the marginal revenue product, and that equals marginal revenue times marginal product. Is it downward sloping? Uh, here, actually, although it is possible to talk about this without calculus, it's more rigorous if I use calculus. So I'm going to pause and write down some calculus. I'm not going to ask you on an exam to derive it. But let me just show you what the result is. I wrote one more explicit version of marginal revenue product here. Marginal revenue product equals marginal revenue, which itself is a function of the quantity of output, times marginal product, which is a function of the amount of water. Then I did what's in calculus is called using the chain rule. Now, in, in this equation, if you don't know calculus, you should just think of the d's as as being deltas. So it's the change in whatever the whatever follows. So the left hand side is the change in the marginal revenue product over the change in water. So that'll the marginal revenue product is the demand for the input. So if it's positive, the left hand side is positive, then that'll say that the demand curve is positive, and if it's negative that'll say the demand curve is, is uh, downward sloping. Let me say it again. If the left-hand side is positive, that means that the demand curve is going to be upward sloping. And if it's negative, that means that the demand curve is going to be downward sloping. Because the idea is, again, interpret the the, uh, the d's just like deltas. It, uh, if this is positive, then when w goes up, the MRP of water, which is the demand for water, would go up, which would be an upward sloping demand curve. Now, we hope that that doesn't happen, but that's the interpretation. Let's work out the right-hand side. I'm not going to explain how I got the right-hand side. If you happen to know the chain rule, then you'll understand it. We have to do this term by term. How does marginal revenue change when corn output changes? Well, if you have competition, then the marginal revenue curve is flat, which means marginal revenue doesn't change when corn output changes which means this is zero. If you have monopoly, that is a monopoly in the corn market, then the marginal revenue curve is downward sloping. So as Q goes up, MR goes down, so this is negative. Next term. And if you buy more water, what happens to corn output? It goes up. 
what's the margin product? Here's the margin product of water. It's positive. Okay, so that takes care of the first term. Then we have the second term. We have marginal revenue, which is positive. And here we have how does marginal the marginal product change when you increase water? Well, that depends on whether you're in type 1 or type 2. You have a type 1 cross-section of the production function, then as you increase water, you decrease the marginal product. If you have a type 2 cross-section, then there's an initial portion of increasing returns, but then because of the law diminishing turns, you know, eventually that's going to have to be negative. So what does this result in? Well, the first term under competition is zero. And under monopoly, it's negative. The second term under type 1 is negative, and under type 2 is positive and then negative. Can we get from that that it's always negative? Well, if it's type 1, then it's either going to be 0 or negative. If it's type 2, and the reason I said if it's type 1, then it's going to be either 0 or negative. If it's type 1, then the, the second term is negative, and the first term is either 0 or negative. So you get either 0 times a negative number if it's under competition, or you get a negative times a negative if it's under monopoly. So that ends up being either 0 or negative. If it's type 2, the same thing is going to be true eventually. In the beginning, the signs are going to flip because you got this initial positive part. What can you say overall? Uh, well, I think uh, o overall we're going to assume that the whole thing ends up being negative. I might have said something not quite right a moment before, so let me do this more carefully. Uh, here are the different possibilities. So I drew, a, drew a table. First possibility, first row, first column, competition and type 1. If competition and type 1, the first term is 0. So under competition type 1, the first term is 0, the second term is negative. When you add 0 to negative, you get a negative. Second term, competition in type 2. So competition is 0, and type 2 is this. So 0 makes no contribution, and you get the, the pattern of positive and the negative. Monopoly and type 1. So monopoly and type 1. You get a negative plus a negative. That's unambiguous. Negative. And finally, monopoly in type 2. You have a negative and then that pattern. Now, in the beginning, you have a negative plus a positive, which has undetermined sign. It depends on which is bigger, the negative term or the positive term. And in the end, you have negative. So what I'm going to conclude is that although it's theoretically possible that input demand curves might be upward slope, or at least have, it is possible that they have an upward sloping portion, and that's represented by this case. Uh, we're going to ignore that because in, that would just be a, a temporary part for small amounts of of the input, small amounts of water, and then eventually 
uh, a lot of diminishing returns would demand that uh, you get a negative marginal product and then that it be negative. And so we're just going to assume that we've proven that input demand curves are downward sloping with the caveat we haven't really proven that and in fact there is a suggestion that for small regions they might be upward sloping but usually they're going to be downward sloping. So that's the demand curve for inputs.